I'm Kier from In Defense of, a fandom inclusion and community podcast that's part of the Gun and Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on this network are individually owned, and the opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other really interesting geeky shows at gunageeknetwork.com. And welcome to Play Comics, the show where we look at video games based on comic properties and how well they stick to that source material. I'm Chris, and today I've got Alistair Wallace from Gets Off with Dr. Snuggles. Alistair, how are you hey, today? Hey, good. Really glad to be here. I'm excited to uh, to talk about this one. I'm really glad to have somebody from so far in the future, <laughs> because yeah. we're really jumping into PS1 games here, and it's a big <laughs> jump from the 16-bit stuff. Yeah, it seems appropriate. Uh, although, let me tell you, the, uh, the, the, the general mood on this game has not improved in the future. Oh, that's too bad. It is not any better received. Today, we are looking at the first home console appearance where it actually matters of the Fantastic Four. <laughs> and I have no yeah. idea what took them so long. It's uh you know I think it's a, it's a weird property and it was uh it was a weird property throughout the uh throughout the 80s and 90s. I guess if you know if they started making video games in the 60s this would have been one of the first. But uh by the 80s and 90s they were uh, certainly not one of Marvel's best selling books. Fantastic 4 is one of those properties that I've always kind of known existed but never really knew what was going on beyond what the powers were of the four characters. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny actually. Uh, like Fantastic Four was the first uh was the first comic book I ever bought. Um I uh I picked up uh issue 1 of volume 3, which was uh about 97, I think. Uh and I picked it up solely because I, I saw a a preview picture of it and I saw uh Alan Davis doing the art, who uh, I guess people would probably know mostly from uh, Excalibur, the X-Men spin-off. Uh, I guess he's known as a, a guy who does uh, some of the best hair in the business. And that's maybe what uh, what sold it for me. That's what I've heard from some pretty big people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it feels weird to really do like a kind of bio section here. This is deep into video game timeline stuff but the fantastic four we haven't seen them like a couple little side appearances from some spider-man games where they just they're yep. there for a second it could have been anybody else and that's really about it yeah yeah i think they're they're, they're in uh maximum carnage i think uh maybe like the human torch shows up or something i don't know i haven't played that since the 90s it's something like that. <laughs> so the Fantastic Four, at least at this time, is Reed Richards, Sue Storm, Johnny Storm, and Ben Grimm being the thing. Yeah, yeah, and they're and they're kind of the uh, you know the four key characters, and they get swapped out a bit uh, because I guess one of the uh, one of the very easy stories to tell, uh, and one that got told a lot in the uh, in the seventies, is the team almost breaks up and other people have to come and fill in. Which I think is kind of funny just in the aspect of they definitely wanted to keep four members. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, you know, it's something that they've uh, they've actually explored a bit uh, more recently, expanding the roster to, uh, I think there were about 16 in there at one point uh, a few years ago. But it's uh, definitely throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s, it was, uh, it was four all the time. So does that make it like an RPG where you have to pick four of them to go yeah, on the quest yeah. and the others are just yeah. sitting around waiting? Yeah, and the others don't get experience points, so you got to really uh, you got to sub them in and out. That's See, important. 
this is why everybody should do Final Fantasy VII, where your experience also comes from things that can get passed around between the party members. Yeah, it's uh, you know that's the preferable way to play, but uh, unfortunately, it's not the way the Fantastic Four works, I guess. So, what got you into Fantastic Four? It it really was just uh, so I got um, Marvel in the nineties were doing uh, this magazine called uh, I think it was either Marvel Age or Marvel Previews. Uh, something along those lines. And I picked up a copy of that uh, while I was, like, camping. And, you know, when you're uh, when you're out camping, you kind of, especially if you're in a regional area, you got to go to, like, the milk bar or something, and they've got, like, two comics. And I think one of them was uh, this Marvel previews. And I thought, well, this seems like a good, thick, value-for-money book. And so I picked it up, and it had, uh, like, a four-page preview for uh, uh, Fantastic Four Volume 3, number one. Which, like I said, was uh, was drawn by Alan Davis, but it also had uh, this amazing new uh, computer coloring stuff going on, and I was blown away by uh, uh, by the flames on on Johnny Storm, and uh, and so I picked it up, and I, I think I've been uh, basically buying it ever since. And of course, you know, I went and uh, and started picking up back issues, and uh, it's there's some. There's some weird times in there, and uh, there's some good times, and there's some very bad times in the Fantastic Four. But it's uh, it's an interesting book, because it's kind of... It was very popular in the 60s, but it's been uh, weirdly on the periphery ever since. It seems like a property that Marvel wants to make sure you know about, but haven't yeah. really known what to do with a lot lately. It's uh, I think it is very hard to... Uh, to know what to do with it's uh you know they were kind of because it's uh like they're really their first property i mean this is sort of the book that launched uh the marvel universe um they've got this sort of uh, uh venerability but it doesn't always you can't just trade off on that really to write a good story you've got to also have a good story i guess and it's not uh, it's not something that a lot of writers really knew what to do with for a long time, and so there's kind of these uh, like these three kind of key periods in the Fantastic Four, at least in uh, in Volume One, which is the one that was going on before this game was made. You've got the uh, the Stanley and Jack Kirby run from uh, like issue one to issue one hundred and two, and then you've got these weird uh, wilderness years. We just had a whole bunch of uh, different artists and writers working on it, and there's some good stuff in between, but uh, but certainly nothing that's uh, that fondly remembered. And then uh, John Byrne, who uh, I guess people would know uh, as an artist from uh, from the X Men, he did the uh, the Dark Phoenix saga with Chris Claremont. Uh, he wrote it from wrote and drew it from. Uh, 232 through to about 293. Uh, he actually like left mid storyline, which is a very John Byrne thing to do. And then uh, there's a there's a run by uh, Walt Simonson, who was uh, probably best known for his stuff on Thor in the early 80s. He did uh, some stuff in the early uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, which is uh, very good, but uh, probably still pretty underrated, I guess. But those are the kind of the guys who. Uh, who really knew how to write it, who knew how to do something exciting with it. And uh, a lot of the other stuff, especially before this game came out, was uh, really just very middling. And I think the book was uh, selling very averagely uh, uh, before this game came out, at least. Yeah, I know recently I at least heard rumblings of Marvel not wanting to debut things in Fantastic Four comics because of movie rights and just all kinds of crazy things with that. So, yeah, there was that whole thing with the uh with the Josh Trank uh film when that I think even when it was announced they kind of canceled the book for about 3 or 4 years. Uh which is the first time it's been canceled in, you know, since 1961. Uh so that was big. That's um uh, certainly a show of uh, how annoyed they were that Fox wouldn't give them back the rights to uh, to their characters, that's for sure. I mean, when you've got your first family like that, you got to do what you can to protect them, I guess. 
Yeah, that's true. And I, I think, uh, you know, I'm hoping now that uh, that we'll see some interesting stuff with them now that Marvel's actually got the uh, the film rights to it back. I want to say earlier today, I was looking at some stuff and flipped past an article talking about Emily Blunt and John Krasinski being connected. Beautiful. I'm, I'm sold. I'm totally into that. At this point, I don't even care if Krasinski would be Johnny Storm or Mr. Fantastic, because I think he'd be fine either way. Yeah, I think Maybe he, I think he would. Uh, yeah, well, that, I think he's perfect for Reed then. You gray up the temples a little bit, and uh, I think he'd be perfect for it. It's funny, there was actually before the... Uh, so there was the Tim Story movies in, uh, I think it was 2004 and 2006 or so. Uh, and they were... Um, uh, I, I guess successful, but but not exactly well received uh, by fans or uh, critics or uh, <laughs> I guess anyone anyone uh, over the age of about twelve. I don't think was really into those movies. Uh, but uh, Peyton Reed, who uh, who ended up doing Ant Man a few years ago, had a uh, famously had a pitch for the uh, Fantastic Four movie in uh, like two thousand two or so. He was going to do it as a period piece set in the sixties. I think that might be the way to go. It would be a really nice way to kind of show the kickstart into the Marvel Universe. I think so, too. I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's probably the easiest way to get it right. That's for sure. Because it's, uh, like I said, it's it's a, a, a property that really struggled through the... Uh, through the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. It's kind of... It's something that's difficult to modernize well. And there's a few writers who've done it, like the uh, Jonathan Hickman a few years ago did a uh, tremendous run on it. Uh, but it's it, it's a challenging one to get right. So just in case anybody doesn't know about the Fantastic Four, um, let's go ahead and tell them a little bit about who they are. Reed Richards is your leader, and yep. he's basically Stretch Armstrong. Uh, yeah, bas- basically, yeah. he's uh, uh, But he's also a very, you know, he's a very smart guy. He's... Uh, I guess one of the one of the top smart guys in the Marvel universe. And he, I'm gonna uh, very safely say canonically he's top five. He's definitely top five. I don't know. I don't know the exact order. I I might have at one point, but I don't. I don't anymore. It's not the kind of thing I try and remember. I mean, once you get that smart, I don't think it really matters who, what the order is. They're all ridiculously yeah. smarter than us. Yeah, that's that's for sure. <laughs> Sue Storm, uh, his fiance, is the invisible yeah. woman. She can go invisible, and eventually she figures out she has force fields and then gets to be cool. Yeah, yeah. She's, uh, I mean, if you if you want to chart the uh, the kind of differences in the way that women were written through the, uh, through the 60s to now in comics, uh, there are a few better characters to look at than uh, Sue Storm because she really was just kind of the, the damsel in distress in the very early days of the comics, because all she could do was turn invisible. But once you start actually giving her these force field powers, it's, it kind of brings a little agency into it. And I think the general consensus is that uh, Jack Kirby tried to do a lot more than that, more of that kind of thing than uh, Stan Lee did. And you sort of see the, uh, the issues in the early days, at least, where Jack was uh, plotting the book. Uh, she has a lot more agency and uh, a lot more character than when uh, Stan was the only one writing. Yeah, and of course she, uh, you know, they, uh, she and Reed eventually married, but she was uh, she was the uh, Invisible Girl for about uh, 20, 20 years or so. And it took uh, John Byrne to actually say, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we've been printing this character for uh, twenty five years, guys. Maybe it's time that she was the Invisible Woman. I mean, that's only like three days in comic time. Yeah, that's that is true. <laughs> You've got Johnny Storm, the Human Torch, who can fly around and turn himself on fire, and is beaten by asbestos, just like everybody else. Yeah, yeah, everyone was. Uh, that was that was the key way to beat him in the early days. <laughs> you throw an asbestos blanket on him, or some kind of uh, nebulous uh, foam suff- uh, suffocating foam. Uh, flame suffocating foam. He, um, you know, he's another character that I think has been uh, is uh, is very difficult to write well. He's uh, kind of he's hot headed, 
uh, as the powers would suggest. Uh, but a lot of people tend to, tended to kind of just write that as, uh, uh, like, you know, he was a teenager who was uh, rebelling against authority. But, you know, that gets boring after a while. You've got to start writing him as an adult. And uh, so there's, you know, there's a few people throughout the years who've done that well. Uh, but a lot of people have done it badly, that's for sure. And then finally, you have Ben Grimm as the thing who is a giant rock monster. Yeah, yeah. But also really the heart and soul of the team, I think. He's the, uh, uh, he's the guy who's uh, perhaps most in touch with his feelings. And uh, I think a lot of the more... Uh, emotionally impactful stories have centered around him. And his, uh, his quest to, uh, to understand how one can be a giant rock monster, uh, but also a man with feelings. I think that's important. There's something in there we can all learn. I know just from listening to Fantastic Cast for a little bit, there was... A nice long period where he was dating a girl named Alicia Masters. Yeah, yeah, who's a uh, blind sculptor, and of course, you know, she could uh, uh, she could not see him, but she could uh, she could feel his humanity, uh, both in a literal and uh, emotional sense. Oh, that's so sweet. It is. Although, you know, then there was a period where. Uh, he got grumpy after uh, the first Secret Wars and uh, left the team, and Johnny ended up marrying Alicia. But then it turned out she was a, a shape-shifting scroll. So, uh, you know, as you do in comics. And then this might be a weird place to introduce her, but she's in the game, so might as well do it. There's also She-Hulk. Yeah, She-Hulk was uh, a big part of the, uh, the John Byrne run. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, this game takes a lot from... Uh, it, it mostly takes a lot from the, the Lee and Kirby years, but I think there's a real um, uh, affection it has, at least visually, for the John Byrne stuff. And I, I'm not surprised to see that they've, uh, they've put She-Hulk in there. Uh, she was... Um, she replaced Ben when he uh, got grumpy and left. And... Uh, so she was she was in the comic for I think about like uh, you know thirty or forty forty issues. Her powers are exactly as you'd expect from the name. She's a girl Hulk. Yeah. Yeah, she's uh. So the story, the backstory with She Hulk basically, I think, is that uh, uh, so she's the Hulk's cousin, and she was uh, like shot in a drive-by shooting. And then uh, the Hulk gave her, well, Bruce Banner gave her a blood transfusion with a garden hose on her front lawn. Uh, but then, of course, because he's got Hulk blood, uh, she became a She-Hulk. It was mostly to uh, to make sure that Marvel owned the copyright to the name She-Hulk, I think. They could have done a lot worse. Listen, she's uh, honestly, uh, I think... Uh, Perhaps not in the, the like the first volume of her book, but since then there's been some very good uh, She-Hulk runs. Oh, uh, I just meant know, completely she's... for the reasoning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's also true. <laughs> so this game coming out in '97. Um, what really was going on with Fantastic Four at the time that you think made them finally realize, oh yeah, we should probably have a game come out. I that's a weird question, honestly, uh, because I mean it's a good question. But it's a weird time in comics. Uh, because there's really nothing that was happening uh, that would have pushed uh, a game to be released. So this came out in uh, September of 97. Which um, is, one, uh, I think, like a few days before Volume 2 of Fantastic Four ended. And that's a, a weird period to, uh, to talk about. And I'll try and kind of summarize it as best I can. Volume 1 ended in, uh, towards the end of 1996, uh, issue 416. So that was like 35 years of, uh, of the same continuity. And then uh, this whole thing with, uh, with Onslaught in the X-Men happened. 
and I don't, I don't really want to want to bore people by going into the whole storyline. But basically, there was a like an evil amalgamation of Professor X and Magneto's psyches, and all of the uh, the hu- the human based heroes, not the mutant heroes, had to sacrifice themselves by throwing themselves at uh, at onslaught, and they all uh, ostensibly died, except they were. Uh, Shuff, uh, shuffled off into a pocket dimension uh, by the son of uh, the Invisible Woman and Mr. Fantastic, who's, uh, you know, like the most powerful uh, dimension creating mutant in the world. It's a whole thing. They've, uh, you know, <laughs> they tried to shut him down throughout the 70s a lot because he was getting out of control. But they, he saved them at this point. What was happening outside of the, uh, the stories was that uh, Marvel were going broke. And... Uh, None of these books, like uh, Avengers, Fantastic Four, Iron Man, and Captain America, were selling very well. The X-Men were selling very well, but none of the other ones really were. So what they did is uh, they tried to uh, give it this this boost in sales uh, by giving those books to uh, the Image Comics guys who'd left Marvel years before, uh, like Jim Lee and uh, Rob Liefeld. And so uh, Jim Lee ended up with Fantastic Four and Iron Man, and uh, Rob Liefeld famously ended up with Avengers and Captain America. And uh, no doubt if you've been a fan of comics for any length of time, you've seen uh, Rob Liefeld's uh, Captain America. It, uh, it was not pretty, I'll say that much. So this uh, this thing it went on for uh, like just twelve issues, and uh, it did boost sales, but I think not as much as they'd really expected it to. And so this came out uh, like just as that was ending, and this but this game really doesn't take into account anything that was happening in the comics. Like I said, it, it really this is all kind of if you look at the characters that uh, the Fantastic Four are fighting in this game, they're uh, almost exclusively from the first hundred issues of the book. Well, let's ponder over all of that craziness while we drop some promos for a few (laughs) other shows. Absolutely. From start to finish, The Twilight Zone remains one of the most compelling series in television history. In honor of the show, I, Brandon Cruz, and a variety of guests, both regular and special, watch the series from start to finish, and we discuss the characters, themes, and ideas Rod Serling brought to the screen. It's sometimes serious, it's sometimes humorous, but it's always interesting. Submitted for your approval, I present to you a Twilight Zone podcast. Hi, this is John from the Spoiler Country Podcast. On our show, we talk about comics, movies, you know, whatever really fits the boat for that, that topic of the day. We talk to writers, artists, directors, actors, creators, and fans alike, just our friends and people we just met that seem pretty awesome. We have conversations that lead to some pretty interesting places, so you should definitely check it out if you like comics and movies and conversations that lead into very, very nerdy tangents all the time. Now, you can find our show by opening up any podcatcher and searching for Spoiler Country, or simply go to scpod.net. And remember, in an ocean of podcast, we are Cthulhu. Those are some great shows you should check out, but first let's finish up with this one. So, Alistair, you were talking about uh, these crazy villains that were all from the beginning, who are some of them? It, uh, you know, they, they actually start off uh, pretty well with the, with the first issue of Fantastic Four. So the first level is uh, Attack of the Mole Men, uh, in which you fight uh, the Mole Man, uh, who was in the first issue, and also kind of the, uh, the monster that's on the cover of issue one. Uh, from there, it... Uh, the second level, you fight uh, the Psycho Man, who appeared in uh, Annual Number no. Five. Uh, you go into the subatomic world to fight the Psycho Man, who's uh, like an emotion-controlling guy who's uh, actually very tiny, but uh, very powerful, of course. Yeah, he's not somebody I know much about. You know, he's. Uh, <laughs> I guess he's he's like a key figure in the in the Fantastic Four in a weird way because he's the one who. Uh, who uh, changed Sue Storm from the Invisible Girl to the Invisible Woman. She, uh, she beat the hell out of him and realized that she was uh, 
more powerful than just an invisible girl. She was uh, an invisible woman. And so she, he's kind of key in a way. Uh, but that uh, Annual 5 was around like issue... I, I think this is maybe the latest villain who's in the game. Uh, that was around like issue 65 or so. The third level you get scrolls, which everybody should know from the Captain Marvel movie that recently came out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And this one's actually set on uh, on the Skrull homeworld. Uh, and you fight the uh, the Super Skrull, who's uh, a Skrull with the the powers of each of the members of the Fantastic Four. Uh, and he debuted in uh, issue 18. And also, I guess uh, it's, it's kind of notable in this level that uh, it's called The Last Days because the planet's actually being consumed by uh, Galactus, who's uh, another kind of key figure in, uh, in Fantastic Four. He was... Uh, he debuted in issue 48, and the three issues uh, that followed that are kind of considered like some of the best comics ever written, the Galactus trilogy. He's a, uh, uh, an omnipotent uh, being from space who uh, consumes worlds to feed his uh, ever-present hunger. But he's kind of neither good nor bad. He just, you know, he's just a hungry guy. I mean, you got to eat. Can't really blame anybody. I know how for he that. feels sometimes. Yeah, you know, you get uh, you get hungry and uh, you just lose control. Sometimes you eat a planet. It happens. And if you're hungry enough, why not? Yeah, and, we've all and been from there. my understanding, he does listen to Silver Surfer well enough, and you know, eat whatever planet he's given. So it's not like he's going around sniffing out life. Yeah, it kind of uh, you know it goes back and forth on that. Uh, so Silver Surfer is not always his uh, his herald. Uh, sometimes he has less picky heralds. The Silver Surfer, I guess, is uh, is interesting because he's humanity is the wrong word because he's an alien, but he has a humanity and kind of he doesn't want Galactus to be uh, just indiscriminately killing people. But then you have uh, you have other heralds uh, other times throughout the comics who are uh, less picky about that kind of thing. Yeah, what can you do? Some people just have an agenda. Yeah, yeah, exactly. One of the other more successful heralds, though, was uh, in an issue of uh, What If, which is, you know, Marvel's kind of, like, uh, alternate uh, storyline comic that was uh, big in the 80s and 90s, uh, where Aunt May was a uh, was a herald of Galactus. She did quite well. Oh, that would probably be amazing. I need to go find that one. <laughs> it's worth picking up. <laughs> If just for the visual jokes. You know, the the next level you get to go fight Namor, which I know is somebody who's kind of been growing up with the Fantastic Four. Yeah, Namor um, started uh, actually back in the late 30s, like 39, I think it was, in Marvel Comics number one. Uh, so he was really, uh, you know, he was there in the, the World War II comics with uh, Captain America. But then he kind of, uh, kind of disappears for a long time until he's uh, he pops up again in Fantastic Four number four. Uh, Johnny Storm finds him in basically like a halfway house uh, where he's lost his memory and he's got a, a giant beard. And Johnny uh, shaves him using uh, just flame from his fingertips, which is uh, that's some delicate stuff. And then he uh, splashes a glass of water on his face and uh, Namor remembers that he's actually the Prince of Atlantis. And he just looks so cool. And all of the things that I've heard of him with Fantastic Four, just the interactions they have with everything. This is one that I'm really looking forward to going back and digging into some more. Namor's, uh, yeah, na some of the books with Namor are really great, honestly. Uh, he's, a, he's a fantastic character. And I guess the, uh, the plot that they kept going back to in the really early days is that he fell in love with, uh, with Sue Storm before Sue and Reed were married. So there was kind of, uh, sort of a love triangle, although you, you know, you kind of knew that uh, <laughs> she was never going to go for Namor. She was, uh, she was going to end up with Reed. But it, the, the the tension there, I think, was uh, was kind of groundbreaking. In comics, at least. And also, you have one of my favorite names in all of Marvel villandom, Atuma. Yeah, Atuma is. Uh, uh, he's like, um, he's a pretender to the throne of Atlantis. 
He's always trying to snatch it off Namor. And really, what would a Fantastic Four game be without Doctor Doom? Yeah, well, this is where, I guess, you kind of find out what the story of the game that you've been playing for the last four levels is. Once you get to le- level five, it's kind of revealed why you've been jumping around all of these different uh, locations. And really, we should probably talk a little bit about the game, too. This is early PS1. If you didn't grow up playing those games, it's really hard to go like it after playing the stuff that's out now. <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, yeah, I, it's an especially weird one, honestly, because it's... Uh, it's a beat 'em up. I mean, it's you know, it's a Streets of Rage final fight kind of beat 'em up, uh, but it's so slow even compared to those games. So really, you've kind of got uh, you had these masterpieces on the 16-bit systems, and then uh, the first few tries on the 32-bit systems were uh, just sluggish for the most part. For some reason, everybody wanted to go 3D, and they weren't quite ready. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is for sure. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know, honestly, like, uh, the, the character designs I like in this game, still. Um, but uh, the, the level art is uh, very hard to look at. It is murky. I know one of the first videos I watched, somebody was trying to beat that first rock level boss, and... yeah took him forever to figure out that you're supposed to throw rocks at him because he just couldn't see the rocks on the screen. No, you can't. <laughs> that's that's uh, kind of how a, the game is. Yeah, well, that's a that's a gameplay element that uh, basically continues right throughout the whole game. You beat bosses by throwing either other enemies at them or rocks at them. Uh, and it's, uh, it is not an elegant gameplay mechanic. I'll say that much. I'd be relatively okay with it if I could see the things that I'm supposed to throw. Yeah, it's impossible, honestly. I, uh, you know, I had a funny, uh, funny experience with this game back in the day. I think I played it around like '98, but I played it in a, um, in a video shop in my hometown where uh, uh, they would uh, they'd let you play, uh, like rent a game for an hour basically and play it on one of the TVs in the in the video shop. And so I was, you know, I was very into Fantastic Four. Like I said, I just kind of picked up my first few issues of it. And I was uh, hugely excited to find that there was a Fantastic Four game. And I think, honestly, like, if, you, if you're if you only playing it for half an hour to an hour, uh, you know, it's a kind of enjoyable experience. At least if you're, uh, like, 16 or... <laughs> 15 or 16. Yeah, it makes perfect sense because the problem I have with this game is the monotony. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's what I found uh, this time, uh, playing it 20 years later, is that uh, I could really only deal with uh, about 25 minutes of it. Uh, and then uh, I think like you, I, I just kind of watched some videos of the rest of it. Well, especially since... I saw in one video, and I can't believe this. Does this one really not save? No. No, it doesn't save. There's no password system. Uh, you've really just got to start from the start. Every time. I just don't get that at all. I mean, once you get out of cart stuff, how do you make a game that doesn't save? Uh, it's uh, <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> I think you'd have to uh, you'd have to ask one of the developers. I guess maybe they thought it was uh, adding to the replayability of it. Maybe I don't know. I mean, you could go through theoretically and replay levels as different characters, I guess. But well, that's yeah. a, you know one of the other one of the things that I think this game actually does really well is uh, that you can even if you're just playing it by yourself, you can switch on. Uh, computer control characters for the other three uh, members of the Fantastic Four, or She-Hulk, as the case may be. So you can play with uh, with the whole team there. And that, um, I think that certainly breaks up the monotony a bit. Uh, also, if you turn on invincibility, because uh, <laughs> if you can't see anything and you just keep being attacked by, uh, by stuff, it's, uh, 
It's very frustrating. A lot of people like to give me crap because I'll turn invincibility on. I don't care. It's fun. I play the yeah, game. Yeah, listen, if it's Yeah. I mean, that's honestly, I think that's the whole point of games as far as I'm understanding is to uh, to have an enjoyable experience. And Pro Entertainment that made this game, I mean, they would had experience with comic franchises before. Yeah, and they and they did some good ones. And I mean, there there's a lot that uh, that you would have gone through uh, by now. They did uh, the Flash game on Master System. Uh, they did the Incredible Hulk game on uh, on Genesis, which is honestly, I think, at least a reasonable game. Uh, they did Batman Forever, which, well, you know, it's uh, it looks Exists. interesting, yeah. Uh, and they did uh, the Judge Dredd game. I mean, there's nothing super horrible in here, except for maybe Batman and Robin. But, I mean, maybe it's just a PlayStation issue and things that came out in 97. Yeah, yeah. I Look, it's, it's funny, because you kind of forget these days uh, just how many really terrible early PlayStation games there are. You kind of look back and you go, oh yeah, Final Fantasy VII was great. Final Fantasy VIII was fantastic. Ridge Racer, you know... Uh, the first few Tekken games. Uh, but there's a lot of crap, really. There really is. I'm, I mean, yeah. I think this is the hardest generation to jump to is yeah. the 64 PS1 stuff. The only yeah. thing that really did it right, I think, was Saturn because they were just chugging it out as a super 2D system. Yeah, yeah. Some fantastic arcade ports on the Saturn. Uh, whereas I think, uh, you know, and I think maybe that's why the uh, the PS1 Classic that came out uh, towards the end of last year just uh, did not sell. Because uh, there's so many, so many games that are really just not, uh, not that much fun to play these days. One thing I really did find interesting in this game, though, was the minigames in the loading screens. Yeah, there's, uh, well, I, it's, I guess, uh, an interesting concept, the... <laughs> The mini game that's in the loading screen is basically just uh, you drive a. Uh, it's like a top-down, uh, like uh, there was an, uh, a remote control game uh, on the NES that it reminds me of that I can't remember the name of. RC uh, Program, I know, is one of them, but they had a ton of games like that. That's the one I'm thinking of, and uh, like I Iron Man. There was like an Iron Man Challenge one or something. Uh, anyway. But it's uh, it's like that. You just uh, you drive a little car around a uh, a track, and you can shoot stuff. Uh, but it's the same track every time you're on a loading screen. But the interesting thing there is that um, uh, Namco had actually patented uh, the idea of having a mini game during a loading screen a few years before this. Uh, so I guess Fantastic Four was really. Uh, they were skating on thin ice by doing this one. And that just blows my mind that you can patent the idea <laughs> of something like that. Yeah, it was it was controversial. Uh, and uh, it was controversial for the 20 years that the uh, patent was in operation. And so you kind of had, uh, you know, you have games like uh, FIFA and Bayonetta who would kind of uh, work around it by having these, like, practice sessions that you could do during the loading screen uh but uh very few games attempted to uh to sort of just really throw in a mini game the only other one that comes to mind is uh onichambara which was a uh, uh a japanese game where you're a uh a schoolgirl that fights zombies and they uh they had like a 2d version of the game during the loading screen uh and there was a there's a, a lawyer who's uh works primarily in games who kind of suggested that uh, maybe the games that did get away with it got away with it because uh, Namco weren't entirely confident that their patent would uh, survive a court challenge. I mean, I'm right there with him on that one. Yeah, it's a pretty flimsy, <laughs> it's a pretty flimsy one, that's for sure. <laughs> so overall, what do you think this game really gets right? It's I, I'm trying to think back to the first time I played it, uh, and I do think it uh, 
they don't, you know, you've got all the characters there that you would want, and they're doing the things that you would want them to do. And I think the fact that they've thrown uh, She-Hulk in there is is really important. I think it uh, it gives it a lot of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Legitimacy, maybe. I think that um, works because she was pretty popular yeah. at the time. Yeah, yeah, and I think it you know it kind of says uh, it suggests to you that the developers really do understand that uh, the history of this book, even if they're not uh, using any storylines from it. Or really writing a storyline at all. And much more than like any of the X-Men games, you're about half female characters. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. I, I hadn't even considered that, but uh, but that is big for, uh, well, for any beat-em-up in the 90s. And we were lucky to get one in most of those games. Yeah. Yeah, you got, you got uh, one, generally. And I think also the uh, I like the cover art. Uh, that's uh, that's very good. That's using uh, the cover from issue four hundred and sixteen, uh, which I think is you know that's a good cover. So they get that right. What do you think this game really gets wrong? Uh, most pretty much everything else, honestly. Although I don't know, it, like it doesn't get anything egregiously wrong. It's just very boring. As far as lore goes, it looks like it's looking at filler issues. Yeah, and made the game around that. Yeah, it's uh, I don't know. It would be so easy to uh for them to have written a storyline. Uh but they're really just doing a kind of greatest hits. And it uh it doesn't work very well. Well, especially when you can have something like Doctor Doom collects all the enemies that hate the Fantastic 4 and they all take one giant attempt to get rid of them. Like, some super hand-wavy reason why everybody is there. Totally. It doesn't take yeah. much. Yeah. Instead, I, I I, think it's basically uh, that he's, uh, uh, like, making them think that they're fighting these people. Like, they're hooked up to a, uh, to a machine throughout the whole thing. If I'm remembering correctly. <laughs> I only played it a few days ago, and I've already forgotten. That's how memorable this game is. Yeah. Yeah. I also really hate the way that it does uh, special moves. You've got to hold down the uh, the R2 button and then press, like, uh, you know, up, up, down, left, or something. Uh, which is uh, it just impossible to remember for four different characters. Yeah, because they weren't the same, were they? No, no, they're all completely different. This isn't Street Fighter, just... Say this is my special move and be done. Yeah. Yeah, you know, at least uh, like Street Fighter, you kind of, uh, like everyone still remembers how to do the moves for Street Fighter because they're very, uh, very straightforward and memorable. But with this, it's kind of, uh, I, I, when I was playing it, I had to have the guide open in front of me. The, the only thing that I really noticed was Johnny Storm doesn't fly. Yeah, well, I, you know, that's a difficult one to... Uh, to put into games and I think uh, even if you look at later games where you've got flying characters they still kind of struggle with the implementation of that even if some of them did do uh, like a reasonable job of it you know you do kind of run into that Superman problem of being overpowered in a game but I mean I wouldn't mind it if Johnny Storm was weaker than he's supposed to be if he could fly I'll take that trade off just to get the flight yeah, I think, uh, you know, the the characters are, in general, even in the comics, they're all uh, uh, very... They're not easily defeated, but they're, uh, you know, they are defeatable. Uh, and I think that makes for a good game. That kind of circumvents the whole issue that you have with, like, Superman or, uh, or some of the more powerful comics characters. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is very easy to die in this game. Because you've got people, like, throwing rocks at you or shooting you with lasers the whole time. It's uh, death by a million cuts. That kind of thing. So if you've got somebody who wants to get into the Fantastic Four, would you give them this game as a bit of a primer course? Uh, you know, I, I, I knew you were going to ask this question. I've been thinking about it. I think the answer is no. I would maybe let them look at the uh, cover art... Uh, <laughs> I would, I would maybe let them look at the uh, character select screen, 
Uh, but it's so dull. It's going to put anyone off. If I make someone play this game, they're never going to want to read one of the books. I'm right there with you on that one. I mean, I I don't like to sit there and say that a horrible game can't teach you anything, but you have yeah. to get into the game far enough to actually see the things you're getting taught. I, and and that's the that's the biggest problem with this game is that it's not even a horrible game. It's uh, you know if you look at the review scores that it was getting uh, when it came out, they're all like solidly five or six out of ten, and it's a five or six out of ten game. <laughs> it's just. Uh, <laughs> One of the most boring 5 or 6 out of 10 games I've ever played, that's for sure. Yeah, this whole game, it's a product of its time. It's, I don't want to crap on it because it is early PlayStation and almost nothing was getting 3D right then. Yeah. You can almost take the first few years of PlayStation games and just forget they exist. You can definitely, uh, you know, you can definitely shuffle a few gems out of there. But uh, yeah, like I said, there's there's a lot of stuff that's uh, that you've forgotten how bad it was until you start playing it again. For anybody on the younger end of things, just think about all the Wii shovelware titles there are. <laughs> that is very apt. That's a very good comparison. So, Alistair, it's been great having you on. If people want to hear more from you, where can they find you around the internet? Yeah, I do a uh, I do a podcast called Get Soft with Doctor Snuggles in which we uh, explore the, uh, the wild world of softcore films and also erotic thrillers. Uh, but we try and do it in the least creepy way possible. Also, someone recently said that, uh, that my podcast was surprisingly very smart, which I think is uh, that's a heck of a compliment. Uh, and so we're on uh, you know iTunes and Spotify and uh, Google Play, I guess, and uh, you know, wherever else you find podcasts. But we're also on uh, Instagram and Facebook. Uh, and occasionally I show up on uh, some of the other shows in the uh, Companieros Radio Network. Uh, we've got uh, Movie Melt, uh, which deals with uh, like weirdo VHS releases, uh, and also Songs on Trial, where we uh, rate uh, terrible music. Those both sound like wonderful shows, so I'm definitely going to have to go check them out. And we'll have links to everything down in the show notes, So because clicking links is easier than spelling. Yeah, yeah. I uh, look. I I couldn't even give you the web addresses. Uh, people don't have dot coms anymore. You know, you just search on iTunes. That's how you do it. With that in mind, if you want to hear more from me, you can head on over to playcomics.com and see things. <laughs> you can also head on over to Twitter at playcomicscast, or the easiest way to the Facebook group is playcomics.com/slash/facebook/group. Just squeeze it all together like that's one word, and it'll take you right over there. If you want to help support the show, you can head on over to the merch store, get some cool stuff, or if you want to support us on Patreon, you can check us out there. Links to that, again, are down in the show notes. Don't forget that technically Kaylee and I still have a podcast called Meddling Kids because we refuse to admit that we haven't made an episode in months and <laughs> keep getting ready to do it. They call that uh, pod fading. I know. We're refusing to <laughs> let it die in our home. We keep getting ready yeah. to record, and then life kicks us in the nuts. Yeah, I know that feeling. Don't forget that Play Comics recently joined up with the Gunna Geek Network, where a few times a week you can check out Pop Culture Cosmos for new things on movies, video games, TV, and anything else that you might find geeky or pop culture-y, because it's just all cool. New episodes there come out every Monday and Friday. And if you like the music that we're rudely talking on top of right now, head on over to soundcloud.com slash best-day to check out his music. But other than that, just grab a game, grab a stack of comics, and go find yourself a new favorite character. I guess there's only really a handful of other Fantastic Four uh, games, but look, I, I would be uh, happy to come back anytime if you'll have me. Oh, definitely. I mean, I, I do love the accent. Not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah, I get that. I get that a lot. It's uh, <laughs> you kind of get used to it when you hear it twenty four seven. Yeah, <laughs> I get that with people loving the southern one that I don't really have. Yeah, yeah it's a, yeah, it's a little bit there. I can turn it up a lot more, but I just I don't <laughs> most of the time.